scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 36. It says page 78, I think. It's like mine's cut off in your pew Bible. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and it is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. They throw it away. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Do these words our God is still speaking. Thanks be to our still speaking God. Well, happy holiday to you. <laughs> well, we all don't want a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> There's Labor Day weekend already. Hard to believe. Not much left to eat here yet. It's a quarter of it. But I got a real point this point as we begin. What communication employment can you obtain that never gives you a day off? There are no sick days. You cannot earn a vacation. You work 24, 7, 365. There's only one opportunity for advancement. You'll work hard every day at it. You'll never get a raise. You can leave it, though, at your own risk. Think about it for a while. We'll get back to it. In our lesson today, he's on the road again to Jerusalem. And knew it would lead him to the cross. And he's talking to a great crowd, it says, as he walked. Now, he said two kinds of followers. The largest crowd were those who halfway believed him to be the Messiah, wanted to be on hand for that grand opening of the kingdom he was bringing, and thinking they were on our way with him to the empire. The other group, smaller, but yet still large, comes to the disciples. Now this group is more than just the twelve. It's also those who follow him faithfully. They did perceive perceived that Christ trekked Jerusalem with more than an ordinary trip. So he's talking to these people as he walks. He's talking in the most vivid way possible. Jesus told this crowd, who, whoever followed him, was not on his way to worldly power and glory, but must be ready for a loyalty which would sacrifice the dearest things in life, and for suffering which would be like the agony of a man on the cross. See, Eastern language, it's always said in terms as vivid as the human mind can make it. So when Jesus said, if any man comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, and wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life too, he cannot be my disciple. He doesn't mean this literally. What he does mean is that no love in life can compare with the love that we must bear to him. No one or anything can take precedence over Christ. One must renounce even their life and be willing to follow Jesus in the way to death. Those who are not willing to follow Christ in such a radical way cannot be his disciples, he says. See, it, it's possible to follow Jesus without being a disciple of Jesus. You can be a camp follower without being a sword of the king. Hang your honor in some great work without pulling your weight. It's said that once someone was talking to a great scholar about a younger man, he said, so-and-so tells me he's one of your students. The teacher answered devastatingly, he may have attended my lectures, 
but he was not one of my students. It's one of the supreme handicaps of the church. And in it, there are so many distant followers of Jesus and so few real disciples. Our society today is a dismal example of committed disciples. When it comes to our country's leadership, they try to hide behind their, quote, Christian beliefs. When someone says, my Christian beliefs prevent me from doing this or this, so run your nails across the blackboard for me. Oh. Their understanding of real discipleship puts a lot in question. Edward F. Mark Quart, the cost of discipleship, tells us we need to talk about evangelism. And the Christian culture push for larger growth in larger churches. It seems to me that we, the contemporary American church, are forever talking about the pleasures and benefits of belonging to a particular Christian congregation. We hear such phrases in our congregation as we have a great schedule. And you can even come to the early bird special when the church is open for business at 7.30 a.m. for worship. At the next service, we have a great church choir. The quality of music rivals the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. At our next worship service, we have a great contemporary worship service with a band that excels all others. We have a great senior program with so many activities that a senior has an activity planned at least once or twice a week. We have a great youth program, and your child will be influenced by Christian values and Christian friends. And so, information about a congregation is presented in such a way as to persuade people to join our congregation. All the while, no one seems to talk about the fine print as to what this law cost. No, I'm not referring to offering to pay the bills. What it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but it's going to cost to follow Jesus. The mark of a great leader is the demands he makes upon his followers. The Italian freedom fighter uh, Garibaldi offered to his men only hunger and death to free them. Winston Churchill told English people that he had nothing to offer them but blood, sweat, toil, and tears in their fight against the enemies of England. Jesus demanded that his followers carry a cross, a sign of death. Andrew died on the cross. Simon was crucified. Bartholomew was flayed alive. James, son of Zebedee, was beheaded. The other James, Son of Alphaeus was beaten to death. Thomas was run through with a lance. Matthew was stoned and then beheaded. Matthew was slain with a sword. Peter was crucified upside down. Daddy was shot to death with arrows. Philip was hanged. The demands that Jesus makes upon those who would follow him are extreme. Christianity is not a Sunday morning religion. It's a hungering after God to the point of death if that be. It shakes our foundations, topples our priorities, pits us against friend and family, and makes us strangers in the world. Be one of those who would be his true disciples to glimpse the hard personal price each one might be called on the people. For he was certain that dark days lay ahead. Those are the days today in our society that don't have the commitment required to be really true disciples. Or they may be followers, but they are really disciples. In light of, in, in, in light of Luke's narrative strategy, the parable may be seen as, a, as it relates especially to Israel's corporate response led to his question of individual salvation. This is about Jewish rejection and Gentile reception of the gospel. The sayings that follow then encourage Jesus' hearers to consider the cost of responding. Though salvation is a free gift from God, it costs us nothing. It ultimately costs us everything. Our whole life 
is given as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and I add, and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to rep, to test, and approve of God, of what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect. Jesus tells us to be his disciple, we must make choices and bear crosses. We must choose between relationships with family, friends, and those we count dearest to follow him no matter what the cost. Such a choice is bound in a very heavy cross. But it must be daily assumed by all who would follow him and be loyal to him to the end. A choice is required. A cross must be bold. Where Jesus talks about building a temple, he's, he's warned us that if you don't have what it takes to be a disciple, don't go any further. Turn away, go home. Go anywhere but within the Jerusalem. Jesus tells us to renounce all our possessions as well as our earthly relationships. Jesus knew how hard it is to, to love God and man. So hard that it can't be done. He didn't even try it himself, but he warned disciples to make as clean a break as possible with any entangling alliances with the world. You know, it's hard as ever for a person who's deeply concerned about their property to be deeply concerned about their soul. Another warning to well worshipers and would be disciples is to keep their convictions strong and creative. Not lose their enthusiasm for the the kingdom, nor let their loyalty run down. Here's those who wanted to follow him to do so with full awareness of what they were doing. Then they'd be like salt. That was really salt. If their convictions faltered, if their loyalty waned, if their enthusiasm petered out, then they'd be quite worthless. These parables before us today are indeed warnings against the excessive haste and half-heartedness in following Christ. Good intentions, well-wishing, have their proper place. But not enough the serious work of Christian discipleship then or now today. Today there are those who want to decide or better tell us but Christian discipleship is all about in a very radical and very unchristian manner. They use their Christianity to bully others into doing things the way they want it done. A way that's very counterproductive as a disciple. I can't remember anywhere, and maybe you know, maybe I can't remember anywhere in Scripture where Christ bullied anyone. Can you think of a place? Or deny helping someone were declared them second class in society, took their rights away as a citizen through specific laws, or wiped away history as if it didn't exist. I do see where he used to help teach his followers or they need to change society for better. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, Job 8.8, 8. in effect, uh, Bildad is telling Job, look back into history. The ancients were wise and had many experiences that can help you. You would just study the wisdom of the past. You would find answers to your situation. Somebody forgot to read that passage when they set up some different laws. There are those who declare that they're devout, that they're devout Christian disciples of Christ. Yet they seem to forget something in making some of these laws. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18. There's one of the most famous verses in the Bible. How they can skip that is beyond me. It's often important to emphasize the importance of treating others with compassion and respect. Something that's not being done today. Which is followed up in the New Testament. The Gospel of Mark 12, 30 and 31. It's called the greatest commandment. You all know what that is. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And verse 31 is second. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. This has really taken a beating in the last few years, especially in the last couple of years. With all the laws that are being passed, a number of states and nice certain groups of citizens, their rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. The damage that's being done today in the name of being a disciple of Christ is appalling. You know, this month is National Suicide Awareness Month. Y'all know that? Did you know that the young people between the age of 24 and under have the largest number of suicides in the country? 5,000 a month? That's appalling. Even adults of different sexual orientation have a large suicide number. People have dreams, goals, aspirations, and emotions. They're held up to bullying, ridicule, rejected by their schools and neighbors, stigmatized by society, unless socially isolated, all in Christianity, and good intentioned disciples of Christ. I think it was Christ, if I remember right, who approached the downtrodden and rejecting society of his day with love, with compassion. Kindness. Reminds us to treat them as we would want ourselves to be treated. Matthew 7 12, Jesus says, So in everything you do to others, what you would have them do unto you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. When we treat others as we want to be treated, we'll be honest, kind, trustworthy, and loving. I never saw Christ show hate. Any of you see that in the, in, the, in the Testament? I didn't. You look at what's going on in some of our churches. What's being preached in some of our churches. What's being spewed out by politicians. A follower of Christ is likened to salt, which is good as long as it retains its flavor. But if it loses its saltiness, it would be better thrown out. The follower retains saltiness, they retain their enduring commitment as a disciple in the face of a corrupt world. To put discipleship and relationship with Jesus ahead of all other allegiances brought the benefit of salvation. But that benefit comes with a high cost of sacrifice. Sometimes even the ultimate price, the sacrifice of life itself. To love God is known as our Creator. To own Him as our Father. It is to be sensitive to His presence in His world. Be aware of Him and rejoice in Him. To love Him means to find the strength and purpose of our life in Him. To worship Him with all our soul. And to follow where He leads with all the energies of our life. To love people only runs as far beyond good intentions as the love of God. It means to own all people as fellow creatures of God. Made in His image, even as we are is to learn to look at other people with trust and understanding, and as they fail, with compassion and forgiveness. There's no refuse to be blocked away from anybody by hate, prejudice, or fear, and to try by every means at our disposal to build a kind relationship with them. To love people is not the serving sentimentalism it sometimes seems. It means entering into the arena of public action and commitment on behalf of a cause. In which we believe that a person who, <coughs> whose rights are in danger. We are finding this as we seek to remove bigotry and hate in some of the churches. We say we're disciples of Christ. We don't follow his example. We went to well. The crowd went to stone there. He hid in lepers. Remove a legion and send them into the swamp. People that others hated, rejected, harassed, and socialized. 
Bigotry and hate can and must be removed from our churches when we realize the good intentions are not enough. And move firmly and fairly beyond them into the realm of church law, and church policy, and programs, and fellowship in the local church. To love people is to take their problems as our problems, to lose ourselves in them with understanding and compassion, and to share as much as we are able in the effort to solve those problems. Good intentions are not enough to carry out the great commission of our Lord. To go to the ends of the earth with the gospel and to be disciples that God seeks for us to be as his followers. Understand the nature of discipleship is as important for believers today as in Jesus' day. True discipleship is still costly. Understand the cost of discipleship requires Equally, that one know the cost of failure to be a disciple. Many may minimize the cost of discipleship in today's society. It's important to rigorously evaluate that cost so one is not misled to believe that somehow it's possible to coexist with society in such a way that the cost of discipleship is less than what Jesus pictured it Be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, there is no discount. Full cost is required of each of us. And by now, you should know what that job is. You have waiting for you 